I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture this first Sunday of Lent <clears throat> to the 10th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. We'll begin with the second half of verse 8 and read through verse 13. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh Christ, into this room filled with no ones and every ones, we pray your Holy Spirit come and speak to our hearts. Show us, Lord, who it is you are and who it is you call us to be. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Isn't it interesting how two people or two groups of people can hear or read the exact same thing and come away with two completely different points of view? This was real for me when I was a kid. Growing up, I was in the middle every way you sliced it except for my mom's kids. My mom had me and my sister. But among my step-siblings, I was in the middle. Among my cousins, with whom I spent most of my childhood, I was in the middle. Particularly, uh, my two cousins, David and Brad. David was a year older than me. Brad was a year younger than me. We grew up like brothers, especially on the weekends at Grandma's house. But because they were brothers, and one was older and one was younger, and I was in the middle, I was often the sort of mediator at times especially when Grandma would give us something, something that had to be measured out and divided, whether it was a cup of boiled peanuts, a sack of M&Ms, whatever it was. Grandma would hand it to one of us, usually me, mostly because my genetics caught up and I got bigger than them. She would hand it to me and say, you need to divide this even among y'all. And so I would. But David, when he heard even, he heard, I'm the oldest, I get more. Because that's what's even. That's what's fair. But Brad was the youngest. And so Brad would hear it and go, well, David always gets more because David's always the oldest. If it's even, I should get more now. Right? That's even. They'd hear the same thing and come away with two totally different ideas about what it was. Most of the time, ideas that served who? <laughs> Them. I think if you could boil down the, the great conflict that has existed in the root and heart of the church since the very beginning, it's that. One word heard multiple ways and everyone taking their own interpretation back with them. I'd even go so far as to say that's what Paul deals with most of the time in his epistles particularly in this section of Romans, chapters 9 through 11. Now, Paul's letter to, to, to the Romans is one that gets quoted a lot, but I don't, I, frankly, if I'm honest with you, I spend more time with Jesus, I think, than Paul. But, but Romans is Paul's sort of grand opus to the church at Rome. He wants to go on to Spain to fund a missionary journey. And so he writes this letter to a church that one might think is just full of Romans, just full of Gentiles, but no, there's a large population of Jewish converted Christians who are in that church there. And Paul's writing to them, and when he comes to this section, he has to clear up some of what's at the heart of their division, or what was boiling under the surface. Paul had preached the gospel, and the Jews heard it one way, and the Gentiles heard it another. When the Gentiles heard Paul say, it is by grace through faith, 
that you are saved, they said, well, good. That means no circumcision, praise God, is what they said. No, no dietary restrictions, no keeping of the law, just faith. Faith is what saves us. That's what gets us in the door. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Paul. But the Jews at Rome heard it differently. When the Jews heard Paul's gospel, they said, yes, it's by grace through faith, but still the law is not null and void. And so when the Jewish Christians converted at Rome, they saw their Gentile counterparts and said, stop waking up every morning intentionally living in sin and become Jews, become Christians. And the Gentile Christians at Rome woke up in the morning and saw their Jewish counterparts and said, stop living a life of hypocrites and become like us. Free yourself. Eat a bacon cheeseburger every once in a while. Paul said, no, you've both missed the point. That it is not about drawing a line and saying, now that you're on Jesus' side, you better get on my side. Paul says, no. That the gospel of Christ is for everyone. And no one is left out. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul says, leaves no one out. And it's easy. And the thing that I, I am most thankful for in Paul's preaching of the gospel is the reality that Paul says the gospel of Jesus meets you right where you are. And I think, while that is the most wonderful thing about it, it's also one of the hardest things for us to come to grasp. Because we are bamboozled and swindled so much by everything else. I fell for it once. I was in high school, a little dumber then, maybe a more dumber now. When I was in high school, I was the first kid in my, in my family to ever go to college. Uh, and, and so as everybody who's in, in that age, you start getting packages in the mail. I guess they still do this. They'd send you, you know, packages from, you know, the University of Washington at St. Louis. And it'd be this big package, a university you never heard of, right? Wanting you to come, wanting you to do all this. That you get flyers in the mail about scholarship opportunities and this and that. Well, one day I got one in the mail and it said... Attend this meeting, this seminar, and all of your college will be paid for. Man, I mean, that's a gravy train with biscuit wheels. I'm getting on it. Let's go. I told my mom, and so we got my aunt, who had a, a Dodge Caravan. I guess whatever car we were driving at the time may not have made it all the way to, you know, Troy, Alabama. We drove up to Troy, we met this group in this room, and I remember there was a screen at the front, a little lectern, and there were chairs set up. My friend Chris Madsen, who to this day I think is one of the smartest people I've ever met, was in that room, so I knew I was in the right place. We had all the chairs lined up, and we sat down in them, and somebody started talking, started talking about credit hours and, and tuition words. I didn't really know what they meant at the time. Then they showed a little video, and, and it became clear what was happening. People had set up tables around the room, people were sitting at those tables with file folders. There were little markers on the front of the tables. U through V, A through D. They knew who we were. When the video was over, they were going to call our name and we were going to come sit at this table. And then we were going to be presented with a package. And if we only paid them a small fee of something like $1,500, they would make sure we had all the money we needed to go to college. This was before I knew Jesus, so I said some things I shouldn't have said. But I fell for it. I'm sure you probably have similar things in your life. We're skeptical of it. So when we hear that the gospel meets us right where we are, I don't know. I don't know. That sounds too good to be true. That's why Paul says the word is near you. Another way to say it is at hand, right there with you, not outside the door. I know we say that, lo, he stands at the door and knocks, but I tend to think Jesus is the kind who just lets himself in. Paul says the word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is, he says, the word of faith we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we tend to think that that's sort of like conscriptive, right? That that's the formula. 
that's the one plus one equals two. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying it's just that easy. It's just that near to you. You know, sometimes I'm afraid we try to stick too many strings on Jesus. We wrap him up in too much red tape, especially after we've made the decision. After we've accepted Jesus. We got to stick strings on him. We got to tie him up, him, paint him in a corner. We overlook the fact that Jesus met us where we were. But there are some folks, Jesus, I don't think Jesus is willing to go there. But Paul says it's near you. Right there. And it's not an overnight transformation. That's something I've never quite wrapped my head around. I know you probably heard testimonies. Oh, yeah, on Saturday night I was drunk in the gutter of the casino. And Sunday morning I was saved, got a degree from Oxford, polished up, and a nice new suit on, all like that, right? No. It's a life. It's a journey. And Jesus doesn't just come to us once, make the decision, and walk away. He's there. Paul says, near us, in our midst, at hand, always meeting us where we are. Which is why I'm convinced we are still left without grounds for judgment. We are left without means for looking at others where they are and saying, Jesus won't go there. He came to me, but I don't know about them. But there again, Paul says, the gospel of Christ lifts up those who call on the name of Jesus, wherever they are. And friends, I'm afraid we're not, we're not real good at that anymore, if we ever have been. I was reminded of this not too long ago, maybe last week. Uh, a documentary started making the rounds again uh, among Baptist folk. It came out in 95. It was called Battle for the Minds. It's a documentary that PBS had put together about the fundamentalist takeover of the Southern Baptist Convention. But this little documentary was specifically about the conservative fundamentalist takeover of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And it featured a woman that I know and is actually connected to some of our members, Scotty and Amber Simpson pretty closely, Molly Marshall. Dr. Marshall was a professor of theology at Southern. But because she was a woman, the new administration and the new movement in the Southern Baptist Convention decided she raised too much trouble. And they made her life miserable. Was she decrying the name of Jesus? Had she denied the reality of the cross or the resurrection? No. She didn't see things the way they wanted them to be seen, and so she was out. The gospel of Christ doesn't call us to such nitpicking, divisive things, but calls us to lift one another up. That's why Paul says, for one believes with the heart, and so is justified, confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. But then he says, the scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. No one who believes in him. We, we focus on that first part a lot, right? One who believes with the heart, confesses with the mouth. Again, thinking this is some kind of formula. This is how it goes. But the point is what Paul says there. No one who believes in him will be put to shame. No one. If someone stands up and says, I believe in Christ, I don't know about you, but sometimes my gut reaction is to say, how? Which Christ? To which? How do you understand the Trinity? What's your interpretation? But that's not what Paul says. No one who believes in him will be put to shame. Paul knew that these Jews and Greeks in Rome we're dividing over these things, trying to find ways to nitpick one another because at the end, they wanted the others out. They wanted someone else to go. And Paul says, no, it's not about splitting hairs over these kinds of things. The thing that unites them and brings them together is their belief in Christ. And it is that belief that holds them up. It is that belief that holds us up. Because it's not about splitting hairs over what it means even to believe. 
It's about acknowledging our shared belief, our shared need, our shared joy. Which is why Paul says the gospel of Jesus Christ makes no distinction at all between folks. Because everyone, everyone needs the Lord. I was reminded about this in really kind of an odd way recently. I don't know how many of you listen to podcasts. I'm a late comer to that for people in my generation. But one that I started listening to, in fact, I've listened to all of it already, was one called The End of the World with Josh Clark. It's not about the rapture, by the way. Um, This podcast was done by a man named Josh Clark who speaks in a very monotone voice. He speaks like this, never really fluctuates his voice. You have to turn the radio up a little bit to hear him. But the whole podcast is about things called existential threats. In other words, things that will end the world and you have no control over. It's really a very joyful podcast. (laughs) It is oddly fascinating. A man with such a monotone voice telling us about the doom that's awaiting us, an asteroid that could just slip past (laughs) Jupiter find its way to our planet, pulled by the gravitational force, smack us, and we're all dead. All of us. White, black, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat. Every last one of us, gone and dead. Joyous, right? That's that's pretty good stuff. Or, Or about, this is what fascinated me. Did you know when they tested the atomic bomb in the desert, There was something like a one in three million chance that it could have ignited the atmosphere and cooked us all. You say one in three million. That's not a chance I want to take. One of the more fascinating ones to me had to do with some of Hawking's theories about black holes, which I'm sure you're all up on. Um, About how the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, when it collides particles at like 99.99992% of the speed of light, may in fact create microscopic black holes. And that one of these microscopic black holes could fall to the center of our Earth and begin to, by its massive uh, effects of gravity, collapse Earth from the inside out. And here's the thing, we won't know it until it does it. Man, I can sleep better at night, can't you? Here's the thing. Here's what, 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 why I say this is a weird way for me to get to what Paul is saying. There is not a thing anybody would be able to do about those kinds of things. It made me think of, and I've shared this with you before, something called the overview effect. About astronauts who, when they break out of Earth's atmosphere and turn to look back, they realize, oh wait, it's so small. It's so small and so fragile, and all those people are fighting about things that in the grand scope of the cosmos don't matter a lick. I like to think that's the point of view of God. Look at all those people, so fragile, so where they are, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter one bit. And I love them anyway. The gospel of Christ, Paul says, makes no distinction between folks. Here are these Jew- Gentile Christians, these Jewish Christians, wanting to know where's the line drawn? What do I, uh, what do I take a hold of? What's the right thing here? Should I uh, subscribe to dietary laws? Is it free? Should I be able to do whatever I want willy-nilly? And Paul says, if you're asking these questions, you're missing the point. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. Paul says, the same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all. Who call on him. For he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no, no application process. When Sally and I went through our adoption, it wasn't just about what are you now? It's, well, in five years from now, you know, what do you like we can tell the future. But yeah, you gotta lay it all out. Sometimes I think we 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 treat our faith that way or at least when it comes to letting maybe others in. When you find it, are you going to flip? Are you going to turn? Are you going to become more and more like me? I'm not perfect, but I'm close, right? Paul says no. God makes no distinction. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, 
everyone. There is no exclusion, I'm sorry, even in the Greek to that word. So Paul wants to clarify that God has made no distinction between the Jews and the Greeks when it comes to salvation, meaning that it wasn't just about one coming around to the other's way of thinking eventually, that God sees over and above the walls we erect to divide us. And it's why Paul says, everyone. Because he means everyone. Regardless of where they are, who they are, or what they do, Christ is Lord of all we sing, and sometimes I think we sing that almost like a military anthem. Christ is Lord of all. That's not what it means, friends. What it means is Christ is Lord of all who will come. That Christ is there with arms wide open for all who will come. It's about a lot more than the power of Christ to rule. It's about the shared common identity we have in Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul says, the reality of God's love made real in the flesh and blood of Jesus is a reality for every person who comes seeking salvation. And for Paul, by the way, this isn't just about a ticket to heaven. Salvation is about being made whole, about being saved from the grief, from the pain, the sorrow, the overwhelming agony and exclusion of this life, from the weight of carrying around one's self upon one's shoulders. And isn't that good news? That the gospel of Jesus is for everyone. Isn't that good news? That the gospel of Jesus are for the Jews. Isn't it good news that the gospel of Jesus is for the Gentile? Isn't it good news that the gospel of Jesus is for anyone, everyone, anywhere, anytime? It's for everyone. It's even for you and for me. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, you come to show us, God, that the way of salvation is open for all. That you call us, Lord, without condition, without application. For Lord, if there was such a thing, what's what good is the cross? Lord, we know that upon it, you made your way known to us. The way of self-emptying love. Even from the God of the cosmos. To be nailed to a tree to die. Help us, Lord, to understand. To better understand with each day, with each breath we take, Lord, that you are God. You are the Lord of all. And that means all. All who come, all who come seeking, all who call on your name. And help us, Lord, this morning to call on your name even now. Move among us, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.